Good evening. I'd like to call the regular meeting of the Sholo City Council to order. Uh, by roll call, see that all council members are present. We'd like to thank those of you who are with us tonight in the audience, as well as those who may be watching at home on City 56 or some other device. So we'd like to begin this evening with an invocation. We've asked Council Member Kelly if he'd lead us an invocation, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance by Council Member Alsop. Those who'd like to join with us, please stand. Our Father in heaven, dear Lord, I do thank you for this very privilege again that we have to come as a group and represent the citizens of Sholo, that you give us wisdom and we make good decisions that are proper for the city. Most of all, my thought tonight turns for what might be considered selfishness. We know that you know our needs before we ask, but it's appropriate the scripture says ask. I ask for moisture. You know, we need it. We need it bad. With that, I would say, please bless our service personnel, home and abroad. Guide and direct them and their leaders. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge I allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Council Member Kelly and Council Member Alsop. Tonight, our first item of business is called to the public. Any citizen desiring to speak on a matter that is not scheduled on this agenda may do so at this time. Know that your comments are limited to three minutes and need to be addressed to the council as a whole. If you'd like to come up here, state. If you'd like to address that, it's come to the, the podium here. It's, it's on the agenda. State later. your name. It's on the agenda later. It's on the agenda. It will be later on another event. No. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sandra Wagner. I live in Country Club Manor. And this has to do with RV parking in our hey, subdivision. Sandra, we have that on the agenda tonight. We'll be talking about that a little later. These are for items that's not on the agenda. So we'll be talking about this issue a little later this evening, and you'll have an opportunity to voice that at that okay. time. Okay. Anyone else on a matter of that's not on the agenda? Call to the public. See nobody moved. I'll close call to the public and come back to our special events. First, we have a presentation of the state of the city. Bear with me as I go through this. We have been busy as a city, so we'll just recap uh, last year. The start of the new year is a perfect time to reflect on what we accomplished last year and to share our plans for 2018. All city council policies and decisions are derived by four major priorities we have identified. One, to preserve and repair our infrastructure, especially roads, sewer and water, two, to pursue economic and community development, three, to improve our quality of life, including better safety, education and opportunities, and four, to maintain an organization with solid and stable leadership. Our major accomplishments over the past year are financial health and outlook, and our future plans consistently support these four priorities. Our city's economic outlook continues a slow, steady upward trend. As evidence, monthly sales tax revenues in 2017 show slight increases over 2016, with retail comprising almost 75% of total collections. We also saw increased construction activity in both the residential and community sectors. Our long-standing policy of fiscal conservatism and saving money for the future allowed us to proceed with several important projects. The most notable was renovating an existing building on the Deusa Clubs into a new public safety headquarters that opened in the late summer. This attractive, highly visible civic addition houses our police department, Navajo County Sheriff's Office substation, and a jail annex. To meet our priority to maintain and improve existing infrastructure, we completed a number of key projects, including upsizing a major water main along the south side of the Deusa Clubs from South 8th Avenue east to Central and replacing a water line on 16th Avenue. 
improving east Owens by replacing a water line, repairing a sewer line, and milling and overlaying the roadway. Reconstructing roads in Park Valley and Fools Hollow area, improving, improving city-owned portions of Pinrod and Sholo Lake, roads and rebuilding 10th Avenue west of Safeway. Replacing sewer lines in the Westwood subdivision, one of the city's oldest and complete, being the upgrade of the sewer treatment plant by adding a building to house testing and monitoring equipment. We connected a sidewalk sections on the north and sides, south sides of the Deusa Clubs near the Clark Road intersection. In addition, Arizona Department of Transportation funded and managed two projects in Sholo. The first project replaced box culverts at 11th Street and Huning, and the second widened US 60 Deusa Clubs from the SR 77 intersection east to 40th Street with final touches to, to be completed this summer. In our pursuit of economic development and business growth, another council priority, we welcome two new businesses, the UPS Store and Sholo Storage. Summit Healthcare Regional Medical Center did more remodeling of existing facilities and late last year broke ground north of the hospital for a major expansion project that will result in new medical offices an ambulatory surgery center, and an administrative services building. In multi-housing, family housing, we saw two seven-plex apartment buildings built on 4th Drive. Boutique Air, the, community, the commuter airline, continues to be successful maintaining a daily flight schedule between Sholo and Phoenix with consistently high passenger use and satisfaction. To improve our quality of life, another priority, our city employees dedicated themselves to providing a variety of events, including sports leagues, kids and family friendly events, holiday happenings, music and entertainment in our parks, library and aquatic center. To celebrate our May 1953 incorporation, we held our annual party along with the annual barbecue throwdown competition. The increasingly popular throwdown drew master barbecue pitmasters from across the United States with savory barbecue offerings at day-long festivities. In the summer, our annual 4th of July parade and Freedom Fest drew spectators and participants from across the region to enjoy patriotic activities, live music, and spectacular fireworks. Our signature Sholo shines for the holidays illuminated our city with sparkling Christmas lights and holiday spirit. We had one of the best Christmas light parades with many participants and spectators this year. At year's end, we counted down to midnight with our Deuce of Clubs drop and fireworks. In improved amenities, we expanded the parking lot at Sholo Bluff Trail and established a community fishing program at Sholo Creek in association with the Game and Fish. We built new restrooms at Sholo Lake Campground and created a fitness zone of outdoor exercise equipment in City Park, which was a 50-50 cost share with the manufacturer. We're proud of our heritage of bringing hope and the prospect of a better life through our community projects and holiday assistance programs. Our employees and community volunteers spent several hours making the dog park more accessible and attractive in observance of Martin Luther King Jr. Day of Service, an annual service day we've held since 2000, we've held since 2009. We also supported the fifth annual Community Fast for Compassion, helping our community raise over $16,000 for individuals and families in need during the holidays. We thank everyone who donated their time, money, and efforts for these causes. In terms of our financial position, the council and staff are committed to using your taxpayer dollars wisely. Our conservative fiscal policy ensures we have the necessary funds to meet your needs and to weather economic downturns. We never spend more than we have budgeted. We also save money to pay for at least a portion of larger, more expensive projects in future years. Our department managers share that vision by carefully analyzing every program to ensure efficiency. I'm proud to say our fiscal policies have allowed Sholo to survive difficult economic times and see modest growth. Our cost conscious approach supports our pledge to deliver full policy and public work <coughs> services, community events and recreational activities to ensure your needs and interests are met. We offered our 19th annual free project clean sweep beautification program 
co-sponsored the annual record-breaking electronic waste collections event and provided a Christmas tree recycling site. Looking to 2018, our plans include extending the sewer main on the east side of White Mountain Road from Hidden Way to Eldred, improving the sewer systems in the Count Town area on McNeil and three older subdivisions in Park View, Park Plaza, and Sierra Vista, replacing a water line in West McNeil from Fox Canyon to the Deusa Clubs, improving the water and road systems along 8th Street to connect with Whipple and Wolford, building four outdoor pickle courts at the city campus on East McNeil. At City Park, we will install new children's playground equipment geared for different ages along Owens, improving landscaping and reconfigure the parking area west of the Little League field, and add curbs and surface materials at the dog park. Using grant funds, we will construct new sidewalks on East McNeil between 8th and 9th Street and replace, replace the sidewalk on 8th Street from East McNeil to the Deuce of Clubs. We will continue to collaborate with other communities to bring added value service to our region, such as our much needed transit system and supporting tourism marketing efforts. 2018 will bring city elections in the fall to fill three council seats and to seek voter <coughs> approval for a revised general plan, which is required by state law to be presented to the voters every 10 years. The city council thanks you for your confidence in our ability to handle city affairs. A sentiment echoed by our fellow Americans. Polls show that, more than a dec that for more than a decade, Americans continued to trust local governments more than state governments or the federal government. Because the council and our city staff are dedicated to remain accessible to you, we welcome your feedback. We are responsive and transparent, and we work together as a group in a nonpartisan way. We believe in retaining local control over the city's budget which must be balanced according to state law. To protect you and our city's assets, we voluntarily impose two permanent mandates to maintain at least a mil minimum of a million dollars in reserves and to require a supermajority vote of the city council to approve any tax increase. We attribute much of our success to the, the able assistance of our city employees and volunteers who deliver their best to serve you. Our advisory committees, senior patrol, and library friends are all provided their service for free, saving taxpayers dollars. We invite you to join us. Come volunteer your time, your talents, and materials to better our community. Join us on May 12th for Martin Luther Day King Day of Service Project or participate in our civic process with the council as we discuss the budget next year. Every budget meeting held here in the council chambers is open to the public. We begin the process in January with the town hall style meeting designed specially for citizens input this Thursday, the 18th at 6 p.m. We'll hold another budget town hall for public input on Thursday, April 5th. The entire budget calendar is posted on our website. The, the political and social landscape in the United States through much of this year has had great change. But let not that deter us from supporting each other, focusing on the positive and enriching the world as we embark on the new year. Let us leave behind a legacy of a better city for tomorrow and for generations. We wish you and your family the best of health, peace, and happiness in 2018. I'd like to say thanks to all of our citizens Thank you for all you do to make our community a great place to live. May God continue to bless us and prosper our community in 2018. Thank you. Our next item, give me just a minute, I timed out here. So. Next item we have uh, is Presentation regarding the prescribed burning and fuel mitigation and firewise program. We're happy to have Steve Best and Gene Baldwin with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council, for having me over. I'm trying to keep it short. Uh, Ann told me I had 10 minutes. So, uh, what yeah, I wanted. Nine. I went a little over. Oh, well. <laughs> just, just pull the yank and tell me when to shut up. Uh, I don't want to start too much in the history, but we're just talking about the advantages and the benefits of prescribed burning. And, um, 
I'm sure everybody here has a really good history lesson and know about uh, the natural uh, fire was the natural phenomena that controlled and managed and maintained these forests here historically before Europeans came. And uh, the way it typically worked, you get a natural lightning strike fire. Uh, it was a low intensity, for the most part, fire that just kind of burned across the landscape and it maintained uh, things in the uh, situation where you just had these low fires that didn't really do a lot of damage, but they kept uh, things in check. Uh, once the Europeans came, they sort of changed that ecosystem to where those uh, frequent low intensity fires stopped happening. Then uh, also they prevented fires. And so then we got a situation where the forest uh, grew thicker, denser, uh, historically, I know it depends on the areas. We have some areas here that are a little denser than, uh, say, the Kaibab, but they have fairly low tree densities, 10 to 50, 100 trees to the acre, and now we have thousands of trees to the acre because of the lack of fire. So as you all know, we use timber sales, uh, veg, uh, veg treatments to control the number of trees per acre and, and thin that out, uh, but we also have to use prescribed fire. and. Um, Mainly, I guess the reasons are, are that it's a natural system and it's natural fire is. Uh, the other thing is economics. You know, we can't afford to do timber sales on all the uh, areas that, that would need to be treated. And plus, a lot of the stuff that uh, we can control with the prescribed fire is pre-commercial. It's not really valuable for anybody um, to, to purchase. And so... Um, for us in, order us, in order for us to maintain the forest in a condition where we don't have the big fires that we've had in the past, we're gonna always need to prescribe fire and prescribe burn. Uh, we have a very, I think, scientific system for doing that. We use uh, weather forecasts. We, we uh, plan the burns on days where the relative humidity is in a uh, situation where we can manage the fire, it won't get out of control and that we're getting the desired effects. So we wanna kill some low, small, shrubby trees, brush, reduce some of those fuels, but we don't typically wanna kill the overstory for the most part. So uh, we plan those out fairly well. Uh, you know, it's, it's like everything else, you get a weather forecast, sometimes it doesn't turn out like you plan. And so we have some mixed effects and this mixed uh, results from that. But typically we do pretty good. We, on this forest we burn, um, somewhere between uh, 15 and, and 30,000 acres a year is what we try to shoot for. Last year we burned about 47,000 acres. Uh, part of that was with natural ignitions. So if uh, we get a natural fire that starts when we have the right parameters to, to control the fire and we think we can control it and get some beneficial uh, effects from it, we can manage that and let that burn uh, under kind of a controlled situation and we get to count those acres as well. Um, this year we've got a target of 35,000 acres. It's a ramped up target. Um, part of that is coming from the Washington office and our new chief and trying to ramp up the scale of restoration so that we're moving a little faster than what we've been moving. One of the big issues that we have with the prescribed burning program um, is smoke and smoke management. I'm sure you guys get calls periodically and I'm sure you get smoke in town periodically from our fires. Um, my deputy so said I should quit saying this, but it's kind of a necessary evil. You know, if we're, we're gonna have fire, we're gonna have smoke. And, and uh, the way I, I try to rationalize that in my own mind anyway is uh, for you guys that were here and endured the Rodeo Chetiscott fire or the Wall of Fire, you know what wildfire smoke's like. It's, it's uh, extremely dense, long duration, lot more particulate matter in those fires than prescribed fires. So um, there's no way to burn without having smoke and you're always gonna have those issues, but under a managed situation, we can uh, mitigate that as much as possible. And it's a lot lesser effects than we have in wildfire. Um, I told the um, Navajo Council, uh, and Navajo County Council that you know, my, my dad has got uh, COPD and, and also emphysema, and so he's very sensitive to smoke, and we're very sensitive to that. We have some, uh, some residents that we're aware of that's made it clear to us that they, they wanna know when we're gonna burn, so we try to uh, do the courtesy calls where we'll give them a heads up, let them know when we're planning burns so that they can make arrangements to uh, either get out of the smoke or just be prepared for it. 
Um, <clears throat> but it's just one of those things we're gonna we're gonna always have to do because even once we do these veg treatments with the timber cells typically and uh, treat the, the forest, we're gonna have to maintain those somehow or they'll just grow back up into the same situation and we'll be starting over again. And prescribed burning is fairly economical. It's a lot cheaper than uh, doing the mechanical treatments. I think, Ed, you might help me, but I think it's about 100 to $175 an acre for us to do prescribed burns, uh, cheaper on some of those natural ignition burns that we get. Um, and so it's, a, it's just one of the best tools that we have in the toolbox to maintain the forest. Um, like I said earlier, the goal is to maintain the ecosystem in the, as close to a natural situation as we can get it, but also to prevent uh, that fuel buildup that's going to cause those really intense catastrophic fires. A um, couple of challenges that we face, one as we talked about earlier is the smoke. The other is um, with our timber management, um, you know, the, the um, the mills and the infrastructure for removing the timber, the loggers and all that stuff is, they're struggling and we're kind of, a lot of them are gone. And so we're really working with them hand in hand to try to, to uh, uh, I don't know how to get them back involved, get them back here. Um, and so we, some of our bigger projects, like you've, I'm sure you heard about the, uh, the four, fry, four Fry Project, which is the uh, Four Forest restoration initiative that it includes the Tonto, the ABRS, the uh, Coconino, and the Kaibab. <clears throat> and we're trying to do these larger land scale treatments to, to hopefully entice businesses to come, mills to come. And uh, one of the big critical things that we need here that we have a lot of is biomass, which is the uh, smaller material that's not really commercial. commercial. It's not big enough to build two befores out of and we have a lot of it. So we burn it right now. We either pile it up and burn it or um, during our prescribed fires, we remove it that way. But uh, we do have a few uh, Novo Power up at Snowflake that is purchasing and, and taking that stuff and burning it in a cogen, uh, creating electricity. And the uh, more of those we had, the better it would be. But uh, right now, that's, that's really the only tool that we have for maintaining the forest. So. With that, I, I could open it up for questions and see if you have anything specific. Any questions, Council Member? You stated earlier that you couldn't afford to uh, cut the timber, etc. Or you know, uh, people coming in and, and uh, utilizing the timber. What what did that mean? Um, well, <clears throat> we 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 do offer timber sales, so we we sell the timber to uh, the, some of the local companies here in town and they, they purchase it. But some of that material is so small, it's um, pre-commercial, it's not okay. really valuable, you can't cut it into a two before, and that's the material that we're really dealing with on the prescribed burning and, and okay. the biomass issue. Anyone else? Councilwoman Kakavis. You mentioned that there's a pre-burn number that people have called that you can they can get notification prior to the the burn. Can you tell us what that number is? Um, well, we have we have a, a list of people that have expressed to us in the past that they were interested and wanted to know when we were burning, and uh, the districts when they know that fire uh, that burns coming up we go through this mailing or uh, phone list that we've obtained over time and we call, give them a call a courtesy call to let them know we're going to burn so they just call the district office yeah it's usually at the district's offices and uh, there that's where people call to let them know they want to know about it and also there's the uh, what is the 311 um, there, this, the county has some, and Gene might talk to that a little bit. 511. 511. <laughs> it was close. Uh, and and that, they give out information on the burns. Because a lot of people, you know, uh, when you're in a fire prong area, as you guys know better than me, uh, when you smell or see smoke, you, you want to start calling people to find out what's going on. And, and uh, th that thing has been really helpful for everybody to find out what's going on with fires and prescribed fires and wildfires as well. 
Yes, council member. So the smaller stuff that you, you burn or sell to the biomass, do you ever open that up for recreational fire pits at your house where you can just go with your saw and after you thin the bigger stuff out of there and before you burn, can we buy a permit to go in there? Or once it's once you guys start logging in it, it's, it's done? I mean, we all have recreational fires and we're not gonna stop at Circle K and spend $8 for You're that. You're talking about firewood, firewood. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. even if it's, you know, it's not in for indoor use, but you, I mean, everybody has an outdoor fire, not everybody, but right. is that ever open up where a guy go get a truckload where instead of burning it all first, go in there and let open it up, nobody shows up, then burn. Well, we, we can issue firewood permits. You know, we sell those typically right. for firewood. Uh, there is some authorities where we could give away free firewood. We've done that uh, in other places. I don't know if we have here, other forests I've been on, we've done that. Um, th this stuff that I'm talking about typically is too, I don't even think people would get it for firewood. It's really Well, that's what I was stuff. talking about, like the pine that you're not going to burn in your house, but you're going to burn outside in your fire. I'm, I'm not aware of us having any permits like that. I'm looking to Ed. Ed's been here for well, I just thought It's just an like idea. That. I mean, I'm talking outdoor firewood, not indoor. Brush, so. brush pile burning or whatever. I yeah. Know, you, you, it I, seems I, like you can always use some of it, but. I, I don't think we have anything like that. Okay. I, I don't, I've never experienced anybody come to, to ask if they could get some brush to burn. Well, not so much the brush, but the smaller stuff you were just right. talking about, you right. know, for your fire pit outside for, right. instead of fine it'd be nice to go out there and get it all before you you burn it up right any other questions comments any other comments of you guys tonight here steve or gene or ed gene has some we um i do, I, I do want to say uh, that we have a lot of support for the prescribed burning program and i'm very appreciative of that i know like i said my dad has copd and he doesn't really appreciate it when we burn around him but at the same time he understands that it's it's just part of the process, and um, uh, there's uh, some people a lot more sensitive to fire or smoke than uh, <coughs> others, and, we, and we're aware of that, and we try to mitigate any way we can. Um, but you know, we uh, Ed was showing me some areas this uh, this season, this year is going to be burned right here close to Sholo, and and we're very likely going to put smoke in town, you know, and it's just. Right. It's so one of those things we try to, to mitigate as much as we can, but it's just, uh, as they told me not to say, necessary evil, I think. Well, we just compensate with putting more fish in the streams, okay? <laughs> All right. <laughs> that, that's usually not our shot, but we, okay. we will support that. Gene has something to say. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Gene. Thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members. Thank you for having me up here. Uh, my name is Gene Bodwin. I am the Northeast District Manager for uh, Arizona's Department of Forestry and Fire Management. And I'd like to speak a little bit about uh, preparation for this year's oncoming fire season. Uh, as Councilman uh, uh, Kelly had put during the invocation, the lack of moisture and we need it. We need it real bad. Uh, with that said, we're pushing our FireWise program extremely hard this year. Uh, we will have the uh, third annual FireWise Summit here on the mountain. Uh, the flyer will be coming out shortly. I will be speaking with the uh, committee members here this next week about where and what time it'll be. So we're going to have that on the mountain in the latter part of April. Uh, other programs besides FireWise, we have the Ready, Set, Go through Navajo County. We also have uh, fire adapted communities. And we would want to push that out to our community members uh, as well as our visitors up here. Uh, we have people through the fire department that are trained for FireWise to do assessments out there on individual properties. We'd love to get that outreach out to those members of the community so that they can call their local fire departments and we can go out and take a look at their homes. There's a lot of little things that homeowners seem to miss. You know, little baskets hanging on decks, 
those are like a baseball bin for fire brands. Uh, firewood stacked either close or underneath the decks. Those are another like baseball mitts for uh, fire brands. And it's little things like that that homeowners seem to miss. We're not out to tell them to strip their land, strip their property, clear cut it. I enjoy the trees myself. Uh, I've been on the mountain since uh, 2007 and I love it up here. I'm going to retire up here and I want to see this thing green with trees the entire mountain. But I do want to get the uh, information out to all our members, all our residents and visitors are <coughs> coming up to the mountain. And uh, with that, with the Firewise program, our prevention programs, Ready, Set, Go, fire adapted communities, we're gonna make a real hard push through the state this year to make sure that that message goes out. And uh, with that, we also have grants that are available for people. And I will let your grants uh, department know which grants are available, what time of year they're available to apply for, so on and so forth. And that'll help the community members you know, especially the ones that are strapped for money. Uh, with that said, uh, FireWise, up until the first of this year, we had only one community on the mountain that was recognized nationally as a FireWise community. We now have four. They are all in the Pine Top area, but we do have Sierra Pines that we're gonna uh, start working on and hopefully have them become a firewise recognized community here in the near future. But there's a lot more out there. We need that uh, push. If you're parts of HOAs, mention that at those meetings. We'd be more than happy to come and talk to any of the POAs, HOAs, any of those community groups and uh, get them on board and talk to their residents. So with that, I'd like to open it up for questions. Questions, comments? I just think, you know, like if without any moisture, if, if it continues, you know, that is gonna be very serious this year. And, and being firewise, that's just, even if we have a lot of snow, being firewise is always great. So yes, thank you for what you guys do and uh, putting that out. You know, get that as early as April instead of as late as April. <laughs> I would say on your, on your meeting possibly there. You can yeah, what we're trying to do there. is hit the uh, uh, part-time residents up here. You know, okay, and so hopefully we can catch a lot right. of them. That's true. Any other questions, comments, council? Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you. Next item we have is a consent calendar. Uh, any items that need to be Hold or discussed. Tonight we have on the consent calendar consideration of acceptance of a grant for Merle Act Activation and Innovation Network and authorizations of associated budget transfers and the City Council minutes of the regular meeting January 2nd, 2018. Move. Council Member Leach, uh, motion to move, seconded by Council Member Alsop. Any discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? Let's see that passed seven to zero. Thank you. Next item is a public hearing new business. We have a public hearing resolution R2018-02, adopting the Sholo General Plan, declaring a public record a certain document titled 2018 Sholo General Plan and submitting the 2018 Sholo General Plan to voters. Uh, Mr. Trigaskis. Mr. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Show. In October of 2007, the City Council adopted resolution number 2000 R2007-49 which adopted the current version of the Sholo General Plan. This plan was approved by the voters in March of 2008. The state's Growing Smarter and Growing Smarter Plus legislation mandates that all general plans <coughs> must be updated every 10 years and presented to the voters for approval. The recommendation is to present the new 2018 general plan to the voters in the next regularly scheduled election on August 28th of 2018. The existing 2008 general plan was developed with help from a 14 citizen general plan advisory committee. In response to rapid growth and growth patterns, the committee was charged with assisting in drafting a completely new 
2008 general plan. This new plan was created following committee meetings, community surveys, public open houses, uh, technical advisory committee input, and staff assistance before it was approved by the voters in 2008. <coughs> As required by state law, cities and towns must adopt new plans or readopt existing plans every 10 years. Staff presented the proposal to update the existing 2008 general plan rather than completely rewriting a new plan to both the commission and council in study sessions. Based on the local economy over the last 10 years and the subsequent lack of development, the consensus was that the previous projections were still valid. This update includes new demographic data and revised maps within the existing document to reflect current city limits and conditions. A review draft of the 2018 general plan was presented to the Planning and Zoning Commission prior to the mandatory 60-day review period. Following this presentation, staff distributed the proposed 2018 general plan <coughs> to, general, to various agencies for the required 60 days. No comments were received. The Planning and Zoning Commission held a public hearing for comments related to the 2018 general plan at its regular meeting of January 9th, 2018. No public input was received. <clears throat> Following the public hearing, the Commission voted unanimously to recommend approval of the 2018 general plan to the City Council. Um, do have uh, a few items here just to kind of go through <clears throat> to discuss what is a general plan. A general plan is utilized as a basis or guidance for land use decisions, provides demographic information, uh, provides for future land use projections, it's utilized for capital improvement plans such as roads and trails, and provides requirements for developers. Uh, as an example, if we show a road on the general plan in an area that's currently undeveloped, and a developer comes in and wishes to develop that part of piece of property, uh, we then can point to the general plan and that road as a requirement of that development. Uh, the question would be, why do we have to update this? We have the state statute that requires that it be done every 10 years. Uh, we know that this was done uh, in 2008, but it also pro allows us and provides us an opportunity to update the information that's contained in the plan. Uh, and that's important because as we apply for grants uh, and other types of things, as we look through the CIP plan, we then can use this updated general plan as a tool. Uh, for example, if we're applying for a grant to uh, put a bridge down by Shola Lake, uh, we can point to the general plan as a document that supports that application. Uh, we look to update uh, the demographic data uh, for example, our population in 2006 was estimated at 10,555. Our 2016 estimate is 11,176. Uh, we look to update uh, the new city limits and uh, total area. In 2008, our city limits was 40 square miles. Uh, it's now 65 square miles. Uh, we look to update our general information. Uh, as an example, uh, average daily water use in 2006 was a little over 1.1 uh, million gallons per day. Uh, currently, we're pushing uh, 1.6 million gallons per day in 2016. And then we need to update so that we're in compliance with state law. Uh, we also want to update some of our uh, property, uh, the projections for what's going to happen with the property. Uh, as an example, in our current um, general plan, we show the county property out on Penrod Road as a, a governmental use. Uh, the county has indicated that that may change in the future, and so we have uh, revised our general plan map to reflect that possibility. So rather than a government use, uh, it may be a commercial use in the future. Uh, so moving forward, what would happen uh, following uh, approval by the council? Uh, it would be taken to the voters for approval. That would happen in August of 2018 at the next regularly scheduled municipal election. So with that, uh, staff is available for questions. This has been scheduled for a public hearing. Thank you. Any questions of staff at this time? <coughs> Council Member Kelly. I, I would like to spin off of your example of a undeveloped piece of property developer comes in and and wishes to do something with that and we show a traffic a flow 
would require a road in a certain location. And so we would probably say to that developer, well, we need this road built through here. Provided, however, good engineering would indicate that the road could be built off of that site and still meet all traffic flow requirements by good engineering. Is it true that the general plan would force that road to be built just where we put it on the general plan or might it be moved? Uh, as you can see on the, the slide in front of you, we show kind of uh, the developed area of town and then you can see the areas that are not developed. Um, and you can see that we've kind of indicated potential roads and trails and things like that through those undeveloped areas with just a dashed line. Uh, that would indicate that there is flexibility in the location of that. Uh, obviously things, topography would play a large role into the, the location of those roles. So certainly there's some flexibility that's uh, meant to be included with that. I thank you. That was my understanding of how this works. And I just wanted the public to get that perspective and hear it from you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? I'm going to open, uh, thank you at this time. I'm going to open this up to public hearing. Any citizen desiring to speak on this item here of our general plan may do so. Seeing nobody moved, I'll close the public hearing and bring it back for any other questions or a motion. Council Member also. I move adopt resolution number R2018-02, adopting the 2018 Shuttle General Plan declaring as a public record a certain document filed with the city clerk titled 2018 Sholo General Plan submitted to the 2018 Sholo General Plan to the voters for the city of Sholo. We have a motion, second by Council Member Kelly. Any other discussion? Call for the vote. All those in favor? Any opposed? Let's see that pass seven to zero. Thank you. Next item is consideration of ordinance number 2018-02, amending section 13-3-4, blocking traffic of chapter 13 traffic of the Sholo City Code. Mr. Trugaskis. Thank you once again, Mayor and Council. At the October 5th, 2017 Council Retreat, staff presented information to the Council related to the occupancy of motorhomes, recreational vehicles or RVs, campers and similar type vehicles on city streets. This information was presented in response to a citizen complaint about a neighbor occupying an RV parked on the city street for several days. Following this discussion, staff reviewed existing city code regarding parking on city streets and occupancy of RVs and similar type vehicles. While there is no section in city code that specifically addresses occupying RVs on a city street, section 13-3-4A, blocking traffic, prohibits parking any vehicle on a city street where the parking of such vehicle results in less than 20 feet in width of the remaining roadway for the movement of vehicle traffic. Additionally, section 15-1-44L states, campers, motorhomes, and travel trailers in conjunction with a residence may be inhabited for no more than 14 consecutive days and no more than 30 days in one calendar year. This section does not specifically deal with the situation of an RV or similar type vehicle being occupied while located on a city street. In response to these findings, staff is recommending that section 13-3-4, blocking traffic, be amended to add subsection C. This addition would prohibit occupying a motorhome, recreational vehicle, camper, or similar type vehicle located either fully or partially on a paved street or sidewalk. Parking these vehicles in the right of way would not be affected provided the vehicle is not occupied and the remaining sections of 13-3-4 are in compliance. Parking in areas signed no parking is always prohibited. Parking occupied vehicles in the right of way also would not be affected provided they are not parked on a sidewalk or the paved portion of the street. The proposed changes are shown in ordinance number 2018-02 as bolded and underlined and I am available for questions. Any questions, <coughs> comments of council? Mr. Council Member Alsop. Thank you, Mayor. Justin, I got a question for you. If, if this thing goes, let's take this big picture. If I have an RV 
and I hook onto my truck and I take the RV around the block and I park in front of my house and I go grab my boat and I go put it on the back of my RV and I go inside to pick up some stuff and I leave. Is there gonna be a time limit where you can have an RV or something <clears throat> if you're hooking it up to go do camping or go recreate compared to understanding of living out there on the dang road? I understand the two concepts, but I don't want people to think that if you pull an RV out and you're getting it ready, that you can get a ticket for having a block and something. All right, the, the proposal that is before the council this evening uh, deals only with RVs that are being occupied and, this, and the public street. Uh, so a vehicle that is not occupied, a uh, scenario that was presented just by Councilman Alsop, uh, would not be affected by the provisions as uh, before the council. However, uh, provision A of 1334 says you cannot block a street and leave less than 20 feet of pavement width there. So in that particular scenario, uh, technically, theoretically, possibly, yes, you could be in violation of existing city code uh, if you were blocking more than 20 foot of the, the pavement width. Uh, but the things that you're discussing tonight, uh, because the RV is not occupied, would not be affected by what is, is before the council at this time. So to answer that just a little bit more then, if we as a city have a road that is not up to the major width, and I have a eight foot wide RV and I pull it off into a ditch or whatever, as long as people can pass you, then you're gonna be pretty much okay unless, unless you come out there with a yardstick and measure the dang road to find out what, you know, if I'm a half inch too far out or half inch too far in. Um, correct, the, the 20 foot's the magic number, but um, I think there's a little bit of understanding with our police officers and who enforce that regarding um, okay. being practical. Thank you. Any other comments? Councilwoman Kakavas. Justin, you talked about the occupancy of these vehicles. What about um, how long can an RV or a vehicle stay parked on a right away area unoccupied? Is there a time limit? Is, you know, is it a parking space forever for a vehicle? Uh, currently under city code, if, a, if a, a street is not signed, no parking, um, and the vehicle does not appear to be abandoned, uh, my understanding is there's really no uh, restrictions, requirements that that vehicle be moved after a certain number of days or a certain number of hours. Any other questions? Councilmember Kelly. An observation, I believe this is the topic the lady would like to address. Yes, it is. I'm sure you didn't miss that, but no. forgive me. Just uh, going through a council first. So, well, at this time, would... if you'd like to come and present uh, what you'd like to, we're open to that, and then we'll continue to discuss. Just please state your name and where you live for the record, please. Sandra Wagner, and I live in Country Club Manor. My address is 1400 North 40th Drive in Shallow. Um, I do have some questions. Last week or so, I had a meeting with some other neighbors, with Ed Muter, and we were discussing these RV situations. Um, one of the situations I had last summer, um, my neighbor across the street had someone just visiting, but they were blocking traffic where you had to stop if the oncoming car was coming towards you. And I remeasured our street today and it's 40, uh, 24 inches, I mean 24 feet wide. This RV in particular was at least 12 foot width, so therefore they were blocking the street where you couldn't, both traffic could not go through. Again, it only lasted for about four days, but more and more people are having RVs and campers and everything else, boats, et cetera. Um, and at times they do block the streets. So, you know, I, I, <laughs> I'm kind of against anything on our streets. 
I'm also against RV parking in the front yard, which is another issue. I understand that, but it's an issue with us. Um, and during our meeting last week with Mr. Muter, now this evening, are you voting on this particular item, section 1334? It's on this uh, evening. It is uh, proposed for a motion tonight, yes. Okay. So at this time, you don't know if you're going to go to A, B, or C. You know, what do you mean by A, B, or C? Okay. So A is, uh, it is unlawful for any person to stop, stand, or park any motor vehicle or an other vehicle upon a street in the city in such a manner or under such conditions as to leave available less than 20 feet width of the highway for free movement of vehicle traffic, except that a person may stop temporarily in the actual loading and unloading of passengers or when necessary in observance of traffic signs or signals of the police superintendent. Uh, that's our current law now. The only thing that we're looking at changing tonight would be item C, which it is unlawful for any mm -hmm. person to occupy a motor home, recreational okay. vehicle, camper, while it's on a paved street or sidewalk. Okay. And so what A and B is currently part of our ordinance that we have, and we would just be amending that by adding number C. C. Okay, I just want that clarified. Any other questions from anyone? <laughs> okay, thank so, you. You know, part of it is also what we do here is we're also <laughs> mindful of the entire uh, city, you know, so we have to be mindful of everybody as well, and we, we are aware of your situation, and. And this hopefully will keep people from living while they're parking in, in violation as well. add one thing? Sure. Sorry. Um, we still have that motorhome in the cul-de-sac. He goes from the cul-de-sac to the driveway, cul-de-sac drive. It's been there since last May. And this is the issue he has. I mean, granted, it's in cul-de-sac. It's not in the main high street that we're on. However, it's still monkey see, monkey do. He does it, I can do it. And that's a situation there. And it's very difficult at times. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, Councilwoman Kakavas. I am concerned with the the time frame that we're allowing vehicles to park on the street. You know, I understand. You know, um, for instance, in a cul-de-sac, if you're going to park there for a temporary period, but um, I wouldn't consider you know, seven months, a temporary period for parking a vehicle in the city right away. There's also vehicles over um, in some of the subdivisions that have been there for a year or longer, sometimes many years. Um, that impedes um, their neighbor's uh, use of that road. And so I would like us to consider revising that a little bit to um, limit the time that uh, people can park on the right of way. I would have to agree. A part of it, we see, we have several streets that maybe a dead end goes there, so that becomes that neighbor's. He thinks that's become part of an extension of his property, mm -hmm. and he uses that for his particular parking. There comes a, a time though where we probably need to address. You know, I can see going forward with what we have adding this one, but maybe this isn't the end of improving uh, this, if possible. Council Member Leach. By passing this, this also gives us, uh, law enforcement can go out there. So like their situation, instead of calling the city hall, if this passage, you need to call the police stations and, and let us know, because of course they're not everywhere either. So once this is passed, instead of calling city hall, say, hey, that guy's over there with the motorhome, call the police station, because now he's in violation of this order. So it, it's now they can go over there and cite the guy or have it towed. So instead of calling city hall, it gives you the right, they can enforce it now. Yeah, the passes, sorry. Council Member Kelly. Yeah, I believe we all probably saw a need to correct a situation that existed, and this is an effort to take it in that direction. Is this the be all to end all? No. And it may need to be made even more restrictive 
if you've known me very long, you probably know I want to make it as least restrictive as possible and not have one person offending or making others have a lesser use of their property. In other words, abusing the system. So um, I know it's been put forth in discussion at least in the past uh, by a council member that all RVs and all trailers, boat trailers and everything else be parked off residential properties and streets. You know, make commercial lots where you can park these things, get them out of, get them out of town, get them out of the residential areas. Well, that's carrying it too far as far as I am concerned, for sure. But if somebody's blocking a roadway where you simply can't get through, I think we get close to 100%, although not 100% of the citizenry saying, you don't have a right to do that to me. I don't have a right to do that to you. Um, RVs, other than if it's on a curve and they happen to be quite long, I, I wish I knew the law, I believe it's eight and a half feet wide is a vehicle, I bet somebody in here knows that. And that could be a pickup with a camper, it could be a dually pickup truck or something. It's the same width as a motorhome. But where you're on a curve, the long motorhome affects a wider section of the street. So we had some streets in town that aren't paved very wide. And if you parked on them at all, you'd probably leave less than less than 20 feet unless you were parking a motorcycle, maybe. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's a good faith effort at correcting the problem we had in the past and certainly a good faith effort at preventing the abuse of creating city right-of-ways as recreational vehicle parking for the sake of living in them. And that wasn't the intent by anybody, I don't believe. So that's been, had that loophole plugged, if you will. I would like to see us go forward with what we got in front of us. And if situation develops that it isn't enough, then we crank in some more regulations. But let's don't jump off the deep end, is what I'm trying to say. Appreciate Thank that. Thank you. Council Member Alsop. Thank you, Mayor. I don't, I, Justin, I don't know if you can answer this question or not. Blocking a road is, to me, and maybe I'm wrong, Blocking a road is blocking a road where no traffic can go in and out. Having a, a vehicle or a trailer hooked on, getting ready to move in, in 20 minutes or a half hour, and, only, and you have one lane of traffic where one person has to stop and go through and, and you have to take your time. That's, to me, that's not blocking the road. That's restricting the road or, or the flow of traffic. But does it come into this? To this wording here that if if I pull an RV up there and I'm loading thing up and people's got it one at a time one direction is that blocking the traffic or is that restricting uh, based on current city code anything that that results in less than 20 foot of pavement width would be defined as blocking the road even though as you're saying there's still the ability for people to get through <sighs> It's not a two-lane traffic. You are, are, in actuality, restricting, but by our code, less than 20 foot uh, would result in a violation of city code. You know, I, what I don't want to see, and I'm, and I'm with Gene, is say somebody has a trailer and they're pulling it up and they're going to try to back it into their yard so they can haul off a bunch of brush and it's a long trailer and it's a big trailer and they try to back it up and two or three cars come down the road and they can't get through. To call a police officer and come and tell that guy he's going to get a ticket because he blocked traffic for five minutes. Right. That's right. But I think, you know, Council Member Alsop, 
that is the current law that we have. We're not, we're not to just change correct. that, and that's what we currently have. And I don't think any very few people have been cited in this community for. But no, I just you know I, I I just understand the lady's thing about blocking. So I just want to make sure right. what blocking the road is. Oh yeah, I mean if you can't get out and you and if you're a citizen and you want to call and say that my street out front is blocked, you have that right, and we have an ordinance to help protect those people. <laughs> But what we're talking about tonight is adding just that it's unlawful to occupy a motorhome, camper, similar vehicle located either fully or partially on a paved road. So that would include a cul-de-sac or anything like that if they're living in it. Correct. Occupying it there. So that's the portion with us tonight. <clears throat> you know. I'll just try to say hurriedly, I believe that most of us driving down the road in a full-size vehicle and we come to a 20-foot 20, 20 roadway left open, are not going to just go ahead and meet oncoming traffic. We're going we're gonna to let that oncoming traffic pass, and then we're going to make our move. If you did the math, I'm thinking you got well less than a foot on each side, and who wants to trust the other driver <coughs> for that kind of right. thing? So common sense tells me you're going to stop and let me buy if it's your side that's blocked or vice versa. And that we see happen on a regular basis. Uh, council member also makes a good point of people like to pull their motor home up to load groceries and gear when they're going to just go up on Greenspeak for a while. And some people don't have enough room to get that unit completely off of the road while they do that. But they're probably not going to be more than 30 minutes in having that happen. They're not going to cause anybody any more inconvenience rather than just wait for that one car to meet and go past. And so I think it could be straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel if we're not careful. And that's... All I want to say. It might be kind of goes to that. You can load and unload, just, you know, be free. But I think, you know, council member also up the definition, you have to make it somehow. And the best way they could was 20 feet. It could have been 19. It could have been, nobody's going to be out of the tape measure. 20.265. Maybe in Scottsdale, but not here. Yeah, on that side of it. Okay. I'll look for a motion on this item. You want to read by unanimous? Oh, we need you to read ordinance, sorry, and by title only. Thank you, Ann. If you'll do that first, please. Thank you, Mayor. An ordinance of the Mayor and Council of the City of Sholo, Arizona, amending Section 1334, blocking traffic of Chapter 13 traffic of the Sholo City Code. Okay, I'll bring it back now for a motion to adopt Ordinance 2018-02. Council Member Kelly, main motion mm -hmm. for a second. Again, yeah, second by Vice Mayor. Any other discussion? Call for the vote. All those in favor? Any opposed? See that pass seven to zero. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, we are making steps forward, and I just hope uh, that you can continue to re you know we can work with your situation over there as well. Okay. Thank you. Next item we have is item eight D, which is uh, consideration of essential air service proposals, Mr. Cup. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, every two years, the U.S. Department of Transportation, DOT, solicits proposals from interested airlines to provide essential air service, EAS, for the Sholo Regional Airport. The latest round of proposals was submitted to DOT on Monday, December 11th, 2017. Four airlines submitted proposals to DOT, Boutique Air, Great Lakes Aviation LTD, Tropic Ocean Airways LLC, and Precision Aeromedical Transport LLC DBA Sunrise Air. The Department of Transportation allows the host city to provide input regarding its preferences as part of the selection process. The final selection, however, is solely a DOT decision, but takes local re recommendations into consideration. Although not a requirement of the selection project, process, the city may opt to perform interviews with the, with the proposing airlines. Um, the deadline uh, for any recommendation from the city is February 12th. And uh, just as a recommendation, not really a staff recommendation, but some options that you have might include 
a recommendation based on proposals or performance alone, or live interviews with all or some of the proposers. And Mayor and Council, I will turn the discussion over to you. And myself and our airport manager are available to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Appreciate that. Put the council for any comments, questions. Council Member Alsop. Thank you, Mayor. I, I, I guess I need to go with Morgan on this one. Uh, I did receive through my email a thing from uh, an email from uh, Prescribed uh, Aero Med Transport, Transport LLC, and I went in and deleted it. I didn't even read it. So I don't know. Do we have to let you know that we received something like that, or what do we have to do? So the council. Uh, you know, norms and procedures say that if you do receive contact from an outside person, you just d d um, disclose it to the council. That's all you need to do. I think we all got I, I also got received an email, and I've also had uh, some discussion with a representative of, of Sunrise Air. He doesn't like you. <laughs> I just want to make sure <clears throat> that we didn't do it. Yeah, so wrong. basically, so everyone has the same information when you're voting. If it went to everybody, then, then you all have it. Well, I think just because we've done it in the past, I think we should schedule time to meet with all of them. I mean, that's the way we've done it in the past, whether I think we even recommended someone else and they went with someone else last time, didn't they, or something? Or maybe that was a few years ago. Anyway, I think we should, if the council wants to, obviously, I don't want, I don't like more meetings than we already have, but show up at six and be done by seven, I'm sure, with four of them before one meeting would be great for me. Not sure how everybody else feels, but I'd like to see them all. Any other comments, input? Council Member also. Well, have we had any um, complaints from Boutique Air here lately since they redid all their, didn't they refile? Is it what they did a couple years ago or last they year? They did, I, you know, Boutique was a newer company. I mean, it, we weren't their first uh, airport, but they had some growing pains. I think, you know, as far as the feedback that we've received, uh, there's a couple of things that are notable. One of those is that we are meeting our employment numbers, which allows us to stay in the program, which was in jeopardy at one point in time. The other thing is they've been purchasing a lot of fuel here at Cholo and that's made a tremendous impact on our revenues up there too. And that's one of the things that they committed to do for us. Uh, you know, and I, I thought that's exactly why we went with them because of, uh, well, and I see Great Lakes is back on here again, but you know, it just, it was such a big turnaround. Uh, I mean, Boti there pulled us out of some disaster there. And like you said, they're really starting to uh, help us with the with the fuel and then also with the, uh, all the customers they have up here in, in the White Mountains. So. I uh, I understand, uh, you know, I like to listen to hear and see what everybody else has to offer, but I think Boutique Air really uh, pulled us out of some type of bind in the last three or four years. So. I'll just share, uh, basically we got the four packets, okay, and looking at the four packets <coughs> of who we have between the four, we also have to look, that was submitted to Department of Transportation, DOT. Their proposal is not going to change what has been submitted to them. And so... I will say that the first two on here, Boutique and Great Lakes, put a really good pr prospectus together. And so if we were to recommend one of those two, it kind of supports what they have done. It, although we have a local person and a new person here, they're one page application. It doesn't give a whole lot of information. Department of Transportation is gonna say, why are they recommended these people off of a piece of paper proposal? It doesn't make us look as good as if they had a really good proposal the same and equal interest of time if we all want to trade them back through here we can but I look at it as uh, similar to we have had good service with boutique I don't know why we'd want to go back with uh, Great Lakes uh, <coughs> given the two if there was a reason that we needed to it's great to know that they're here and maybe it's just hospitality but other than that you know I don't have a problem either way either interviewing or not interviewing people that's a memory killing. Are you kind of saying if it ain't broke, don't fix it? Kind of. <laughs> kind of say, I mean, I mean it, it, it's good. And, you know, like I say, it's just a recommendation. We don't make the final selection. Right. If we were making the final selection, by all means, I'd want to see all of them. But a, Department of Transportation doesn't even do that. They just go off of what was submitted to them. Let's move 
particular. And I have a question. Do we have knowledge of a significant area of service or performance that Boutique promised that they did not comply with? where they failed to do what they told us they were going to do. Yeah, Mayor Council, um, I don't think there's any place where where they have been remiss in what they promised. One of the things, staff did have a conversation with Boutique as well um, a couple of weeks ago, and one of the things that we mentioned was the amount of um, the dollars for marketing uh, that they, they said was available to Sholo, and I think it was, yeah, it was significantly more than what Great Lakes had had committed to, um, and we asked them, "Well, we haven't necessarily seen that much money spent in the community." And their response was, "Send us some events. Ask us. Um, you know, they're they're willing to listen to to uh, to our needs, and uh, they're certainly willing to live up to that commitment for marketing and and uh, supporting." I, I do believe they they did sponsor a little league team or had some support in show a little league so they're available and, and they just said all you have to do is ask and and uh, they'll respond so that's the only probably the only segment that uh, that they could have been remiss in but I think it was just us not necessarily pursuing those dollars I think in the proposal they show somewhere around twenty thousand dollars they've sent on marketing or something here in this area mm -hmm. uh, locally and then you have your fuel cells and and things as well they've done the only other thing that i might add and, and of course these are all airlines and so you know they have an airplane they can get here but it, it is a tremendous a significant expense to these folks to to show up here and and uh um, i'm certainly not gonna going to make a recommendation but that's something else to keep in mind i mean it's just like we all have automobiles but it still costs money to travel somewhere and, and visit somebody so we can either interview everybody or we can make a motion to possibly recommend one of these four i guess this is where Also. You know, Mayor, I just, I, I, I think we, well, Boti pulled us out of a, a big bind, and after even going to D.C. and talking over there, uh, I don't think, if, if it wasn't for Boti there, I think we would have lost this a long time ago. And I think they helped us out a lot. And um, If they were goofing up and if they was not promising people and they had cancellations after cancellations like Great Lakes did before, and it was just a nightmare. I would say let's interview all four of them and we'll go with somebody else. But my thought is right now, Boteed Air is, is supplying the needs of not only Sholo, but all the White Mountains up here and, and they're doing a good job with it. And I'd just like to go with that if we if we can do that. That'd be a recommendation. And like I say, it's a recommendation and the final out say is still in the Department of Transportation. We're willing to work with any of these four. So can you live with that? Is that a motion? No, I'm just uh, it was oh, a recommendation. recommendation. You know, I think well, we make with, a motion what we to went recommend with, with Great Lakes. Go ahead and make a motion. I start talking over you. Well, I'll go ahead and finish, and then come back, and I'll make a motion. Then <laughs> what we went through before we uh, selected Boutique, or we were uh, given Boutique service. Uh, I've I've seen a turnaround in the the ridership, the attitude of the people that travel and use the airlines. I think that uh, from that standpoint, uh, Boutique has my vote of confidence uh, with regard to uh, changing. Great Lakes was very good. They bailed the city out at a time when, when we were in trouble. Great Lakes yeah. bailed us out. We used them. Then Great Lakes had some trouble. We used them again, and then we gave Great Lakes a chance to even when things were bad, we gave them one last chance, and then that's when we basically had to do something to try to save our EAS, and that's where Boutique definitely performed and continued on their renewal, probably better this year than they did their first uh, two years. That's a woman could call us. I've actually heard a number of personal stories with people that I work with where um, Boutique will call them and say, are you on your way or they check on them and make sure that they're going to be able to meet their flight because they fly it as a commuter service 
for for work and so it, the services really increased the customer services increased exponentially I spoke over Mike council member also I make a proposal that uh, we send the name of Botite Air to Essential Air Service to to uh, hopefully adopt them to keep on with their air service here in Shell, Arizona. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second by Vice Mayor. Any other discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? See that passed six to one. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cup. Thank you. Next item we have uh, tonight is uh, current events. Any council member wishing to share anything on current events may do so at this time. Council member also. Thank you, Mayor. I uh, just attended a couple of board meetings this last couple of weeks. Uh, one was at Cholo Main Street. Uh, it, we had our end of the year, uh, how, every, how we did and, and where we turned up, and uh, it, it, we did a great job. Uh, I have to hold it to the Main Street for the Farmer's Market and Art Walk. Uh, they did an excellent job this last year, and, and just to let you know, they've already started selling spaces for next year. They got 92 spaces, and out of the 92, they only got 23 left right now. And so it's going fast. And that will open up May 26th through September 29th this year. And so if you're interested and you'd like to have a space, go ahead and call Diane North at North Star at 928-532-2680 uh, and get, get your name in one of those spots. Uh, the other thing was that uh, we talked about um, was the way, way signs, wayfinder signs. Uh, they're in the final processes of getting powder coated and getting painted and then we had to get them up here and then get them thing uh, mounted and and so you guys know what goes down what road and everything else but this has been a two-year process for main street and so we're looking at a uh, finishing up that project this year and having um, the new wayfinder signs looking just like our lights that we have right now down the main street so uh, the other thing is i went to uh, uh wait finder signs wayfinders like wait, 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 wait. like, like uh, <laughs> Direction. Like Domino's Pizza's down this road. Oh, okay. And I thought you said wait. <laughs> that accent, right I guess. Or left or, uh, wait. Wait. <laughs> okay, so anyway, the, the, the other one was uh, uh, been attending um, Meals and Wheels uh, board meetings. We've been having them, instead of once a month, we've been having them every, uh, once a week, mostly because uh, now that we are with uh, NACOG and changing up uh, menus, changing up uh, personnel stuff, uh, looking at uh, new uh, ways that we're going to uh, do the food and just to be a great uh, service not only to the seniors of Sholo but also to uh, everybody in Sholo and make it a, a place where you can you can go eat and, and have a good time and, and uh, the food will be really good. Uh, and I'm not saying it's bad right now, but it's just going to be a little bit better. We're going to try different menu th and, and change things up. But I think everybody has seen the new car driving around town it has the uh, uh, show, uh, Meals on Wheels national logo on it and everything else. I want to put a thank you out to uh, Subaru. Subaru went nationally to, to give different Meals on Wheels throughout the whole United States uh, a vehicle so they could use uh, decaled out the way that they wanted it. And Sholo was uh, lucky enough to get one. It was in the newspaper. And uh, so I want to put a thank you out to uh, Subaru. I also want to put it for Horn Chevrolet for doing the decals and getting everything set up. Uh, I believe it was Vintage Sideworks that did the wrap on it. And I might be wrong, but I'm thinking that's who it was. So I want to thank them for doing the wrap. Uh, we are getting the uh, the Sholo phone number put on for the Meals on Wheels. We're getting some our uh, Sholo um, web page put on there so that you can you can go and look at the meals and stuff like that. But this is a national thing that was put out by Subaru, and I definitely want to thank them. And I think it's an answer to uh, a lot of different things. Or the fleet that we have right now is is getting run down, and at least we know that uh, for a while we won't have to do any maintenance on it. So I want to thank everybody that had a hand in and give us that new automobile. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Any other? Reports of council members. Just want to note we have some council members and the city manager, city attorney, vice mayor, and myself will be going down to uh, legislative day tomorrow, meet with our state legislators uh, 
at the Capitol and be able to give them some input. There are some real crazy uh, proposals of some laws and things that are on the books by our state legislative people. And hopefully we can still continue to keep local control and the things that they want to take away from us uh, current here. So turn the time to city manager. Just a few events to notify the public and council about. The Recreation Department selling tickets for, for $6 each for the Daddy-Daughter Valentine's Dance on Friday, February 2nd. Um, for ages, girls ages 1 through 14 at the City Campus Gym. The staff's also selling tickets for $20 for a concert by the Piano Man on Friday, February 9th at 7.30 p.m. at the Shiloh okay. School District Auditorium. The Piano Man performs the music of Billy Joel and Elton John. Okay. And also the recreation staff's also accepting registrations for the 6th Annual Barbecue Throwdown on Saturday, May 5th. And more information on those events and others the Parks and Recreation Department may have, can, you can reach them at 532-4140. As was mentioned earlier tonight, and uh, in the mayor's state of the city, we're starting our fiscal year 2019 budget process. And there will be a town hall style meeting specifically for citizen input this Thursday, January 18th at 6 p.m. here at the city council chambers. And finally, we want to uh, we express our condolences to the family of Bill Thomas, who passed away last week. He served on the city council from 2002 to 2006. He's an active member of the community, participated in many um, different organizations. At the, he served at the museum, senior center, and as I mentioned, he was a city council member. So our, our condolences go out to his family. Thank you. Any other scheduling of meetings or any other items? Seeing no other business, so I'll close this meeting.